So good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with this session. Uh, my name is Phil Harris. I'm the manager of the Environmental Analysis Unit at NCDOT, and I am the moderator uh, this morning. Um, you are in room eight. If you think you're in another room, then you can exit. But you are in room eight, and this morning we are uh, having a presentation on the USA technology for small site surveying. Uh, that presentation will be made by Mr. Nick Short with, with NCDOT Photogrammetry and Mr. Joel Gulledge with our Locations and Surveys Unit at NCDOT. The uh, second part of the presentation will be um, the 2022 datum update, and that presentation will be, will be made by Mr. Gary Thompson with the North Carolina Emergency Management Office. Um, he is the Chief of Geodetic Survey. So um, I understand we, these, these um, presentations are going to take uh, going to be very informative, a lot of, lot of good information. And uh, if we can, we will try to take some questions at the end, or you can catch these guys after, the, after this morning's session. So with that, um, I think I'll turn it over to Nick. I'm going to try to pick this mic up. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, awesome. All right, so I'm Nick Short. Uh, thanks for stopping by this morning. Thanks for being here. Um, like, uh, like Phil said, uh, I'm going to be tag teaming this with Joel Gulledge, the assistant unit head of the Location and Surveys Unit, and I'm in photogrammetry. Um, <clears throat> before I start, um, also, like Phil said, you can catch me. I'll be here all day. So if, if we don't, for some reason, have time for questions, um, you'll see me come grab me you know, in the hallway. Um, I'll be in other sessions like these as well throughout the day. And you, you'll also be able to find um, our staff out at the, uh, at the table. We're out in the lobby. Um, so before, and also, before I get started, I'm kind of curious. So who here has used uh, UAS for surveying on one of their projects? You can just raise your hand. OK. Who hasn't but want to use it on their project? Show of hands. OK, so a few more. Who has tried to use it, but for some reason just couldn't due to maybe regulations or some other type of hindrance? No? No one? OK. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to quickly go over some uh, regulatory considerations. I'm also going to go over uh, NCDOT, uh, us, uh, location and surveys, and division of aviation is also kind of putting together a, a business program or a business plan to utilize uh, aerial surveying uh, with UAS for small site surveying. Uh, also going to go through the uh, type of deliverable products that can be requested from us and also give you a quick little project highlight of a, a really cool project we worked on uh, late last year. So the first thing uh, we, you know, I'm going to go over is you know, just the laws of, of operating the UAS, right? <clears throat> so there's, in North Carolina, and every state is a little different, but here in North Carolina, of course you need uh, your part 107 okay this is your 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 federal um <clears throat> your federal 107 certificate or, or license to operate a uas anywhere in the united states okay oops the next two things are kind of state specific okay so here in north carolina uh, you're going to need training with division of aviation and you're also going to need a permit if you're going to be operating this in a commercial capacity Now, we're here to not talk about, you know, because UAS can be used for all sorts of things. We're, we're here to talk about surveying and survey products, okay? And so one of the things that, that um, uh, here in North Carolina is different versus some other states uh, is you need a PLS. So not every state actually has um, <clears throat> regulations and laws uh, governing kind of like topographic mapping uh, type services. Uh, but here in North Carolina, you do need to either have a PLS or be working under the responsible charge of a PLS uh, to create uh, these type of surveys. Okay, and these products include orthophotos, orthomosaics, point clouds, LAS files, elevation models, anything with a coordinate uh, on it, whether it's what's right there blatantly in the data or also hidden in the metadata. 
And then, again, to touch again on the, the business uh, plan that we have, um, here's the executive summary. Uh, this hasn't come out yet, but it goes over the roles and responsibilities of the three, uh, the three units, business applications, type of survey and products that we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, you know, the cost, as well as our implementation strategy. So let's talk about some products that we can deliver. So here in the top left, let me see if I can get the light to work. Here in the top left, uh, this is a point cloud, okay? This is an RGB colorized point cloud. So each point on that point cloud has, is colorized based on the imagery it was derived from. Okay, the bottom right, right here is another point cloud. This is a little bit different where uh, this has been colorized based on an elevation range, all right? <clears throat> And so the red, you can say that the red is maybe, you know, five or ten feet from your datum, and then you get up to the canopies of the trees, and this could be potentially be, you know, ten or twenty-five feet above your datum, and then the yellow and the orange is everything in between. And I just made those numbers up, so. Um, now, the thing about the thing about the point clouds is this is a lot of data, right? So some of these could be, you know, even though this is a small site, um, this could be seven, eight, eight or, or nine million points, okay? And putting this into, say, a slower computer or um, maybe you're, you're still working in SS4, select like Series 4 microstation, and ORD is, uh, I think, known to utilize and um, kind of display this data much efficiently with ORD, but if you're still working with some older software, some other software, um, that's okay. We can also decimate this, so we can decimate this to like one foot spacing, uh, two and a half foot spacing, whatever you need. All right, and here's another product we can do. So this is earthwork quantification. <clears throat> okay, so of course if we can make a digital elevation model, uh, we can quantify uh, dirt. So this is a borrow pit. You can see here on the left side, uh, we've got uh, before shot, before the contractor went out and started moving dirt. And then on the right side, um, we've got the, uh, you know, after the contractor has then moved dirt or maybe it's, you know, payday and they need to be invoiced, um, then we can go out, fly two missions, create our digital elevation model, and then we use the prismoidal method uh, to calculate that earthwork quantity. Phil, how am I doing on time? Is it? Did, Seven minutes, okay. Okay, the, the time is off here. I thought I, had, I was at 17. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, seven, okay. Um, so another thing too we found interesting and I wanna talk too is uh, we always decimate for earthwork quantification um, at a two and a half foot spacing. We found that if you, if you use the point cloud to quantify or, or to do your calculation via the prismoidal method, um, even if you do like a one foot spacing, um, the two and a half foot spacing, the processing is exponentially faster and you don't lose any accuracy. Um, so that's something that we always do. You can see down there in the chart, um, it's, it's two and a half foot spacing. So that's, that's always what we do. So another, another product we do, of course, if we're uh, doing photogrammetry, we're deriving 3D information from 2D imagery. Uh, we can also, or we'll always give you imagery, okay? And it's not just imagery, this is a, we'll give you an ortho mosaic. Um, a lot of questions we get is, you know, what's the difference between the imagery that you all give me um, and, and Google Maps? <clears throat> so an ortho mosaic has been geometrically corrected such that the scale is uniform in every direction, okay? So that means you can go anywhere on that image and make a scientific measurement. It's also been corrected for lens distortion. It's also been corrected for any type of terrain relief, okay? And it's also geo-referenced. So not only can you take scientific measurements inside of that image, you can also Geo-reference, you know, put this into a CAD software, put this in a GIS software, and display other geo-reference data, and now you can make scientific measurements between those data sets. <clears throat> and here also you can see, so we've got, um, let's see if I can point to it. 
you can see this little gray, this little gray bar right here. So this actually, I was, I was trying to display a swipe map. I don't know if any of you all have seen uh, our swipe maps or the, you know swipe maps that that other folks can do in the GIS software. Um, but we can have a before and after shot, and you can take your you know your mouse button, or if you're on an iPad, and you can actually then swipe between the imagery. So you can see the left side of the imagery is is February 2016, and then here is after Hurricane Florence hit. This is US 421. You can see that quite a bit of damage. And you can kind of swipe back and forth and see before and after. Um, you can view this on an iPad, on your cell phone, on your computer. Um, so you can walk around out in the field or something like that and kind of see a before and after shot. Of course, the swipe map was too fancy for, for the PowerPoint. So I wasn't able to put that in here. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about is just to give a cool project highlight. Um, <clears throat> we were contacted by the division, uh, division one. Um, and they had an issue where the storm came and washed out uh, some, some sand dunes out on NC-12 and Ocracoke Island. Um, you know, typically w what they said is that they usually have, uh, the, you know, the, the, the water, the ocean kind of just pushes the sand across NC-12 and it's a pretty easy cleanup because all the sand's kind of right there, it's just scattered about. Well, this time the ocean had a different idea and it decided to suck it all back in. <clears throat> and so it was completely gone. And so they contacted us and they just needed, because I believe they already had some as-built of the sand dunes, so they kind of just needed a digital elevation model of what was out there at the time. Um, they weren't sure how much sand they needed to get. They had a borrow pit. Um, and they also weren't sure of how much they had to, had to buy. <clears throat> so we wanted to give them something very accurate, especially when we hear about, okay, we need to make a purchase, do some sort of pay quantity. We wanted to get really accurate. So <clears throat> we talked with them and we decided that UAS uh, you know, platform was going to be the perfect, uh, perfect kind of choice or tool for this, for this uh, incident. We were a little afraid, though, of water. Because with the, being around the ocean, you've got the moving water. Um, and with the drone technology and photogrammetry, you, it, it, the structure for motion algorithm, you've got multiple um, scenes or m multiple camera perspectives taking pictures of, of, of a scene. right? But when that scene is actually moving, that structure for motion algorithm is going to struggle. Okay? And it's going to destroy that data. And you're not going to be able to make scientific measurements in that data because it's going to be destroyed. So we decided to use a LIDAR system along with the RGB system. Okay, and that LIDAR was great because not only does it penetrate vegetation, it also penetrates water. So you can see here in the top right, a little drone right there. It's actually not very little. That's a micro drone. Um, it's about a $250,000 uh, drone. It's you know, arguably pound for pound one of the best drones you can buy for UAS in America at this time uh, for surveying. It's also got a Minivux 3 LiDAR sensor. Uh, that's another $250,000 sensor. Um, so this is, you know, you're looking at a half million dollar uh, system right here. And, and this is, uh, you know, one of the best and, and, and is not a toy. It's, in fact, a tool. Um, so they, they went out there. <clears throat> they got out there, I think, on Tuesday. It took them about a day to get there. They flew everything in a day on Tuesday. And we had the data delivered to the division by that Friday. Um, so it was a really quick turnaround. The division was really pleased with what they got and how fast the quick turnaround it was. Um, so it was a very successful project. <clears throat> Anyways, that's all I got. Um, again, come talk to me. Come talk to uh, Richard Green right here, the, the unit head of, of photogrammetry, if you want, have any questions about any other products that we can provide. Um, but I'm going to pass this on over to uh, Joel Gulledge with Location and Surveys. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, some of the things going on in the location survey as far as our uh, UAS program. Um, Nick mentioned that there was a business case developed early last year, and uh, in support of that, um, location surveys decided that we needed to ramp up our drone program. Prior to that, we had about five pilots in the unit, and we had a couple of UAS uh, platforms uh, barred from the aviation department. So in early 2020, 
we set a goal to have at least one pilot per LNS division. And location surveys is in every division, so we wanted to uh, have the pilots in the areas where they were needed so they could get to the, to the site quickly. Um, and I have to give the hats off to our staff. Once we challenge them, we actually now have 35 Part 107 pilots in the unit. So we far surpassed one per, per office, which was our original goal. As far as equipment, we currently have seven uh, DJI Phantom 4 uh, RTK GPS capable uh, units. And within the next month, we're gonna take delivery of seven more. So we'll have 14 uh, vehicles to use across the 14 divisions. So the equipment and the pilots will be stationed where they need to be to perform the work. Um, we also have one DJI Matrice 210, which has a zoom camera on it. It's very good for shooting video and that type of thing. So what are we doing right now in location surveys? Um, we have done some post-tornado damage, and we'll get into that just a little bit later, and some landslide response up in the western part of the state after Hurricane Fred, went, or Tropical Storm Fred went through, actually. Uh, we've done some bridge scopings um, to give the, uh, the project manager a bird's eye view of whatever project they might be working on. And we've been testing on um, using some some different softwares for small sites to do small quantities, like stockpiles and that type of thing. Um, as Nick mentioned, the uh, LiDAR capable drones, we believe really will give a better uh, product for preliminary engineering. And you also, if you're in a wooded area, you get a lot better vegetation penetration with LiDAR and uh, possibly much faster processing. As Nick said, we, they were able to deliver that data in a very short period of time, which is critical you know, if you're in an emergency situation. Uh, this is some footage from the tornado damage down in Brunswick County early in 2021. 20, uh, we actually have some video, live video of this that we shot, but there again, it's too big to put in the presentation. If you come out to our booth, we'll actually show you the, uh, the video that we shot. And you can see it's very high resolution, um, quite a bit of damage in this area. This is, uh, as I mentioned, we did some uh, work after Tropical Storm Fred went through. This is in Crusoe, North Carolina. And uh, if you look at the photo, on, this is the before condition on the left. On the right, you can actually see the, the slit area. All the material went across the road down into the Pigeon River down here. Um, this is some of the photography from the drone footage. This is a uh, uh, ortho mosaic of 109 photos. You can really, you can really get a uh, uh, a good idea of what happened there. We can do some quantity work off of that. And this is the uh, ortho with a point cloud overlay on top of it, so you really get a good 3D view of what we're looking at. Now, disaster situations do bring up some concerns or some, uh, not concerns, but maybe considerations we need to take into account. So we're developing some SOPs to use in disaster situations. Uh, checklist, you know, anybody who surveyed has probably went out once, once and had a dead battery. Uh, we don't want to go out in an emergency situation and the drone batteries not be charged up, for instance. But we also, we had several employees back at the end of the year and Gary Thompson actually uh, turned us on to this. There was an a online class through the University of Hawaii and they brought together state and federal officials and conducted a uh, interactive workshop on how to respond to disasters using UAS. Um, one of the things that you have to consider, if there's a disaster, there's probably somebody in charge of that site. We don't want to go out and impede any other operations going on in the area. There may be, you know, swift water rescue, fire and rescue. All these folks are all trying to respond to disaster. We don't need to uh, put ourselves in the middle of that and, and impede anybody else. Um, as Nick mentioned, there are a lot of regulations around UAS, and in a, a situation like this, we really need to be constant. That just because there's a disaster doesn't mean the rules go out the window. We still have to follow the rules. So, and that was one thing. We, we, we don't want to impede anybody else, and we want to be safe and legal in our operations. Um, so to that end, we're documenting lessons learned as we go through new situations. 
so that uh, if we do make any mistakes, we don't make them again in the future. Um, pivoting away from disasters, we, we can use UAS on more common DOC projects. Uh, we can do recon, project scopings, uh, we can record uh, project milestone, construction milestones. Um, this is R2303. You can see on the top, uh, you can see that the uh, site is just graded at that point, or just cleared rather. And then in the lower point, six months later, the site has been graded and the ramps have been graded. So you can document these construction milestones for the residents there. Bridge scopings. Um, this was a project down in Division 6, and when the project manager had their kickoff meeting, a lot of the folks in the kickoff meeting couldn't travel to the site to see the conditions. So we actually went out and flew this with a drone. We have video as well, too big to put in the PowerPoint. But that way, the whole team could see the conditions of the site and uh, make a better, much more informed decision on how they need to proceed with the project. This slide was in uh, actually in Nick's part. Um, this is Southport Ferry Spoil site. And uh, what was happening here in the, um, let's see if I can get the pointer to work. There was some washout area here and here. And uh, the ferry division actually wanted to use the material that was already on site to repair it. So they needed to know how much volume they needed to move to repair the site. Um, and uh, so this is the after condition. This was an ortho mosaic, and I think we had 228 photos, mm -hmm. but you can see that now the, the repair is complete here and here. And we were able to determine volumes, how much volume they moved to actually complete the repairs. Um, as I mentioned, stockpiles is another, this is a, a county maintenance yard, different types of aggregates and uh, soil. Um, the, the maintenance engineer wanted to know how much uh, material they had on site so they, if a uh, situation came up, they needed to do some repairs. Did they have enough material? Did they order more material? So we can do that. The, uh, the blue pins that you see are control points that we use to control the photography. And I think the yellow was indicating some vegetation obstruction. We probably should have one on this side as well. And that's just more of a 3D uh, view of the same thing so you can really see the material on the site. So what are we looking towards in the future in location surveys? Um, we're thinking that we can, uh, we can supplement the photogrammetry's manned aircraft data. Maybe photogrammetry could fly the whole five mile construction project and then we can do maybe intermediate quantities on small sections of it, maybe bar pits, that type of thing. Um, we've had several projects out west with all the flooding that um, a lot of the site got washed away, eroded away, so we can document that so we can do some erosion control analysis on the site. Um, as I mentioned, we might do some small bar pits on uh, projects I think we did on the one I had previously. We actually did a couple bar pits on those, on that project. Um, and we have looked into doing possibly some small secondary road additions uh, down in the eastern part of the state, maybe a, a mile long road that really doesn't they're just going to pave the, the dirt roads there, so we can probably get the information we need just from that. Um, but the biggest thing, location <laughs> survey's primary mission is preliminary engineering, so we want to develop this technology to be able to collect preliminary engineering data. A lot of what we showed was disaster and um, construction quantities, that type of thing, but we'd really like to get to the point where we could produce preliminary engineering data. And with that, um, if you have any questions on UAS out in the divisions, there is a division locating engineer in every division. You should know who that is more than likely. If not, visit our booths out there. We have a map showing all the contacts. Mm -hmm. um, photogrammetry will also be out there. Um, if we have situations, we'll, we'll all discuss among ourselves and try to come up with a solution that hopefully we can move this technology forward in the department. And with that, I'm gonna pivot away and let Mr. Gary Thompson talk a little bit about 2022. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. You want to pull up the PowerPoint for me? Yes. 
I just wanted to say I was so excited to talk about the NC12 project. I forgot to mention that that LiDAR system in UAS was uh, actually is actually owned by an external partner uh, that we have. So we have a few uh, external partners uh, that are pre-qualified and have limited services contracts uh, that we use. So I did not want to make that seem like DOT owned that. So thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll talk to you this morning and give you an update on the datum change that's going to occur, not only in North Carolina, but all across the country. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through this before. Um, we went from horizontally NAD27, NAD83, um, vertical NGV29 to NV88. But this time, it's going to be different, because in the past, when we did the datum changes, we, we did the horizontal at one time and the vertical at a different time. So um, when this, we make this change, we're going to do both a horizontal and vertical data change. We're going to uh, create a new state plane coordinate system, and we're going to get change from the U.S. survey foot to the international foot. So it's going to be a, um, a, just a total change of what um, we're referencing our surveys to. And you can see in the slide here, originally this change was to occur uh, in 2022. Uh, but because of COVID, uh, the National Geodetic Survey has, has delayed that. And they haven't set a, a definite date yet, um, but it will not be no earlier than 2024. And from all indications, it looks like it will probably occur in, in 2025. We will, um, Geodetic Survey has legislation that um, defines our state plan coordinate system. And so, Probably about a year before we see that's going to be implemented, we will go in and make some legislative changes to officially adopt the, the new datums that we're going to, uh, to utilize. So currently here in North Carolina, um, we utilize NAD8 for horizontal NAD83 with the 2011 uh, realization. And, and not only have we had datum changes, but even when we went from to NAD83, we had different adjustments or different realizations that we've stepped through. So currently, NAD 3 2011 is what we use, and, and we'll, that will be the reference frame that we'll use until we make the datum change in 2024, 2025. And vertically, uh, NAVD 88 is what we use here. You can see all the list of all the other vertical datums that are used in different parts of the country and different parts of North America. So when this datum change, they're all going to be let's say it will be eliminated and they'll all go to one new vertical datum. Um, and so these are the, and we're also going to go to a new state plane coordinate system. Look, I skipped over a slide. So we will develop a new state plane coordinate system. Part of the National Geodetic Survey plan is that each state uh, was to um, develop a new state plane coordinate system. And these are the parameters they put out. Um, basically, we're going to replace our current one. And history-wise, North Carolina was first in state plane coordinates. In 1932, um, two NCDOT engineers developed the concept of a state plane coordinate system and sent that to the Coast Geodetic Survey. Um, and we were, North Carolina was the first to have a state plane coordinate system. And I think we're going to be first in the 2022 because this week, um, uh, we finalized our our new definition of the state plan coordinate system, and NGS said we were the first state to do that. So we were both first in 32 and first in 22. Um, so it's going to be a reference to the new um, to the new reference frame, and we had two options. Um, the de definition NGS wanted to use was this: they wanted the coordinate values to change by a large amount, uh, so that visually, when you looked at coordinates that are on the state plane coordinate system of NAD83 2011, and you look at the 2022 state plane coordinates, they will look mathematically much larger. Or we could um, ask for some exemptions and keep the coordinate values close together. So the option we went with was, um, was the default to have large coordinate values. And I'll show you a slide to show you how much that difference is. And these are some of the parameters. One of the changes that NGS has developed with this is that we this will be more topographically fitting uh, grid surface which means reduced ground to grid distortion um, and it will be a one parallel system we currently have a, a two parallel system but the biggest one here you can see is the coordinates have to change uh, at least 10,000 meters 
Um, and I'll show you how we've I've done that here with our new state plane coordinate system. So these are the names. This is the name of the new reference system. I joke that um, you, know, you can tell that government agencies got together and come up with these names. Uh, very long. Um, so um, the horizontal is the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022. And the vertical is the North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 2022. And we will also have a new geoid model. So when we're using GNSS technology, we use a geoid model to make that uh, to derive orthometric heights. And I'll show you some of the things we're doing here in North Carolina to prepare us um, for that new geoid model so that you can um, attain precise and accurate elevation using this GNSS technology. So how much change is going to occur? So now keep in mind, this is just the datum change. This is not our state plane coordinates. So horizontally, the datum change um, you can see approximately a, a meter here in North Carolina, uh, horizontally. Ellipsoid uh, height, we're about 1.3 meters. Um, the difference will be. And then since we're changing vertical datums to, uh, the vertical will change approximately a little less than three-tenths of a meter. As you can see, we go across the country, uh, the change uh, gets larger either in, in the northwest part of the U.S. Uh, that difference is over a meter. And to me, I think this is going to be the where we need to do the most outreach with the vertical change, especially at, uh, we're in the Division of Emergency Management, um, Risk Management. And so the floodplain mapping program is housed with us. And so that this is going to impact the floodplain mapping program uh, dramatically because um, Every, all, all of the elevations our flood maps will be impacted. And so we're currently working with FEMA to determine how we'll implement that. Will we do one widespread change? Will we do it as we update uh, the D firms? So there's a lot of discussion going on now of how that, but just the public outreach to explain to the public uh, why um, the elevation at their home has changed. All will change relative, but still, I think it's going to be, this is where we have to spend our, a lot of time explaining to the public. And, and the other thing at the end, I'll, I'll talk about what can we do to prepare. Um, one of the biggest things is, you, a lot of you will probably be working on projects when we make this change, and they'll probably be referenced in 93 2011. We've got to make sure we don't mix datum, uh, data on different datums uh, during probably a three or four year period um, once we make the change. So this change, will not, we will not just do a snap, you know, snap our fingers and have a change. It's going to be over a, a prolonged period of time where all the existing projects will still be on the old datums. And so we'll have to pay very careful attention to metadata uh, to make sure we don't mix uh, the different datums, both horizontally and vertically. So this is our current state plane coordinate system. You can see it's a, um, a two parallel system. And the areas near the parallel, obviously, is where um, the grid to ground distortion is minimized. And you can see the central part of the state. And we have the central meridian. So this is the new state plane coordinate system that we will implement with the new datum. Notice much more green, um, much more areas that uh, grid to ground distortion is, is minimized. And obviously, when you get away from the central parallels, when you get the down to the southern part of the state, the northern part of the state is where you have um, where the, the largest distortion. And then we have the mountains in western North Carolina. We, we did stick with a one zone state, which we'd previously done. Um, a lot of east coast states uh, were stayed with a one zone system. Some of the western states went to multiple zones. Um, Kentucky has both a single zone and uh, a two zone, and I think they may even have some low distortion projection in that state also, but we stuck with the one one zone state. So this is, I just got this from NGS a couple days ago. This shows you the uh, horizontal approximate transformation, basically the distortion. And you can see a large part of the state um, has a very minimized. So that's what I think is good about this new state plane coordinate system is that um, with that um, plane more exists into the topographical area, we have less grid-to-ground distortion. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to, um, the coordinate values will change uh, large amounts. Um, and you can see this graph just shows you how much difference the coordinates will change at a, at a point. And the main reason is we're changing the definition of our state plane coordinates. Our current system, our false northern is zero meters. We have a zero uh, northing. And our false eastern was uh, two million feet. So now we're gonna change our false northern to 200,000 meters and 1,000 meters. Um, we were really the only state um, when we went to NAT 83 uh, that didn't change our faults uh, east end. And the reason we didn't do it was because our land records management system, when we implemented NAT 83, uh, there was still a lot of um, paper and mylar maps that the counties were using the land records management system. And to modify that central meridian was going to have a tremendous impact on those um, paper and mylar products. So we stayed with the, the one, uh, two million feet, uh, two in, NAT 83, but now we're going to make the change in our, um, our new state plane coordinate system. So one of the other things that we do to prepare is to um, gather data so that with this new geoid model that we're going to have in 2022, we'll have um, a lot of data that the National Geodetic Survey can use to develop that geoid model. The more dense data we can collect, the more accurate and precise you will be able to have um, obtain heights using GNS technology. So there's two programs that we've been working with the National Geodetic Survey. One's called GRAVD, uh, Gravity for the Redefinition of the Vertical Datum uh, here in the U.S. And they had two components. One was to collect uh, gravity in an airborne aircraft using an airborne gravity meter and fly uh, the entire state. And that was completed a couple years ago. So we have, um, the National Geodetic Survey has collected airborne gravity here in North Carolina. Um, we were actually kind of a, a test project for them. Um, the eastern part of the state was flown with a manned aircraft with the gravity meter in there. Western part of the state, they brought down a, a UAV uh, to fly western North Carolina. But this UAV looked like a, a manned aircraft. It was a full-size autonomous airplane. Um, but because of FAA regulations, they had to have a um, emergency pilot in it. But the, the aircraft is, was able to fly autonomously. They, they didn't do it autonomously. But, so not only were we using um, new technology as far as gravity meters, also kind of UAV technology to collect that. So that part was collected. The other part is terrestrial gravity data. Uh, where we use both absolute and relative gravity meters uh, to collect gravity all um, to, I'm going to say, calibrate to, to verify uh, the airborne gravity data. And so we've been, we don't, uh, we don't own any of this equipment. Um, the gravity meter there on the right is an absolute gravity meter. That's about a half a million dollars. Um, and then the meter on the left is a relative gravity meter. So we were able to um, get this equipment on loan from the National Geodetic Survey to establish gravity stations, um, mainly in western North Carolina, because that's where um, a lot of the terrestrial gravity data uh, is sparse and also um, it has become, let's say outdated, but it was collected a long time ago with, with older technology. Um, so we were trying to supplement that in western North Carolina, and the picture is just one of our, our gravity stations. So these are the areas that we have completed gravity uh, collection and we have provided that to the National Geodetic Survey. And then we use this in the development of the GEOID 2022 uh, GEOID model. And our goal is um, to see if we can work out along with them to do some more in central North Carolina. Um, the other component is um, a program called GPS on Benchmarks. And this was developed by the National Geodetic Survey and the, and the purpose of GPS on Benchmark is to collect GNSS observations or obtain ellipsoid heights on benchmarks, on, on geodetic monuments that we've run traditional leveling through. And what that results is the data that we can use to uh, develop transformation tools so that we can do transformation from NAD 88 to the new vertical data. And so we were targeted, the ones in yellow are the priority A marks, geodetic monuments, and the ones in blue are um, 
the priority B. And the goal is to get all these observations done by the end of this year. Um, we didn't quite make it, unfortunately, because of COVID, the National Genetic Survey has extended. Uh, we have another year to, to do this. So we had approximately 1,400 genetic monuments that we needed to do uh, a minimum of four-hour observation. And then some of them we had to do uh, dual op occupations depending on uh, have, if they had been observed in the past. So this is where we started in 2020 uh, with around 1,400 monuments to observe. And this is where we are today. And actually we're, all the, the ones, the priority A ones, the ones in the other, we've actually observed them. Um, but we, we're using a tool called Opus Project. It's a tool that the National Genetic Survey has developed. Um, and unfortunately we made too big of a project. Um, and when we tried to upload the project, it um, um, timed out their system. So they're trying to either figure out how to allow us to upload this large project or we'll have to break it up in two. So, so most of that in Northeast North Carolina has been collected. So uh, we're left with about 200 marks left this year. So we'll, we'll get that accomplished. And so we'll have a very uh, good data set for the National Genetic Survey to develop that transformation tool so that if you have the need to go from M8088 to the new vertical data, uh, this will be built into NGS's tr transformation tool. It will allow you to provide um, precise and accurate transformations between the two data. The other component is our cores network, our continuously operating reference station and our real-time network. Um, what we plan to do, uh, the green um, and blue are the existing sites. The red stars are where we plan to, to install additional cores. Um, the one in the yellow we just complete with the partnership with NCDOT. We just installed the one there at Rodanthia. Um, we're currently um, down in the uh, Franklin area um, planning to install. The one in Franklin was on a building that was, uh, there was construction, and so we had to decommission that site. And uh, we found a new site to install it um, in partnership with the community college there. And we're going to get that installed in, in, in late February. And the other ones are just to kind of fill in some holes uh, in our network. So what we plan to do with our cores and real-time network is once the new datums are available, we're going to run two, two systems. Uh, you'll be able to log on if you're on a project that's working on NAT83. Um, you'll be able to log on to a system that will provide you corrections of the NAT83 in 2011. If you're working on the new datum, you'll be able to log on to a separate system. So we'll keep that separate. We did this when we went from NAT83 2007 to NAT83 2011, um, and it worked very well. And at a minimum, we'll keep that operation running for at least a, a year. Depending on the need, we, we may be able we may keep it running longer. As I mentioned, there's uh, there's a tool out there. Some of you may have used Opus Online Position User Service. Um, the National Geographic Survey has developed a kind of enhancement of that called Opus Projects, and it allows you with Opus you just submit one ob observation and it'll process it the same results. Opus Project allows you to do campaign type. So if you have a project where you have 20 marks and you want to use Opus, you can go into Opus Projects and can um, um, do all those at once and have, have a, a project where all those points are in one area and do an adjustment. The newest version, which is beta now, is uh, Opus uh, 5.0. And one of the enhancements of that is now you can also Opus projects and Opus was strictly static. You collected data for anywhere from 15 minutes to four plus hours. And, um, but now you can save, if you're working on a real-time network, you can save your vector data and import that into Opus projects and adjust it in conjunction with static data. So um, we, we've tested this for about a year now and it really works great. Um, the only problem is you have to convert your vector data into what's called GV, GVX format, which is kind of a RINX of, of um, RTN. And um, all, all the vendors are now working to come up with a converter to convert it to that format. But it's out there available if you want to utilize um, Opus Projects 5.0, you can go out to NGS's webpage and, and test it out. 
This is the transformation tool that um, NGS has developed, is currently available. So when we go to the new datum, uh, you will be able to, um, there will be a, uh, an option to go to the new datum and back to Net83. So, and with all the data I've talked about we're collecting, that will be used um, to support this transformation tool. There's a lot of information out there about the new datums. Um, they have videos, they have a lot of uh, workshops. If you don't have time to see them when they present them, you, they record them, you can go back. And so there's a lot of information uh, about our change to the new datums. So the other change I talked about when I started was um, the retirement of the U.S. Survey foot. Uh, traditionally, um, in most states, the U.S. Survey foot was used for surveying applications. Um, and the NGS made a decision that um, this was the best time to uh, implement the international foot nationwide. And there was a, actually a Federal Register in 1959 that said that when the National Geodetic Survey did the next adjustment of the geodetic network, they would convert to international feet. And, and in that 83, that would have been the time to do it, but they didn't do it then. So uh, they feel like now is the time to make that conversion to the international foot. So this is the, the Federal Register uh, of the announcement of that. These are the states that um, use U.S. survey foot and international foot. You see the green states, so a majority of states uh, use um, U.S. survey foot here on the East Coast, South Carolina is the only uh, East Coast state that uh, currently, by statute, uses the international foot. And then you can see some of the, in the central and the western part of the U.S. that use uh, international foot. So this is just the timeline of, of which foot to use. Uh, you can see that um, actually in 1988 there was a proposal to make the U.S. survey foot the permanent, but that didn't. Um, that wasn't finalized. And that 83 is when um, you go back to the old Federal Register. Um, that's when the time that the, the National Genetic Survey could have made the change, and they didn't. At that time, they actually, they actually asked each state which foot they want to use. And you can see from the previous slide that most states picked the U.S. Survey foot. And then, as you know, in the 90s, we, there was a um, push to use metric. So this is the Federal Register I was talking about. You can see that um, they were instructed to make the change when the next adjustment. So since that didn't occur in that 83, the National Geodetic Survey has made the decision to um, make that change when we get to the new, new datum. And so what's the difference in U.S. survey foot and international foot? Well, when you're dealing with small numbers, it's very small, two parts per million. Where it impacts is when we're dealing with state plane coordinates, when we have numbers in the millions. Uh, here in Raleigh, if, if I was to take a current state plane coordinate and convert it uh, to international foot, it will introduce about four and a half foot of error. So another, as we go through the transition, another thing we got to pay attention to is what unit uh, the values are in to when we get the new data. And so this is just um, some bullets from the National Geodetic Survey. So um, originally the change to the U.S. rate foot was going to occur at the end of 2022. Um, the question was asked, since we're delaying the, the datum change, is the foot change going to be delayed? And, and last word we've got from NGS is no, that the U.S. survey foot will retire at the end of 2022. But it's not going to impact us because they will continue, and all software will continue to support U.S. survey fit when you're using NAT83. And we will here in North Carolina too. So as long as you're using NAT83, U.S. survey fit will be the um, unit that you will use. It's not until we go to the new datums that we will use the international foot. And so what can you do to get prepared? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're probably all going to be working on projects when we make the statum change. And the key is to, to, to monitor that metadata and make sure we don't um, mix NMED88 with, um, with any vertical datum or vice versa with a horizontal datum. So, so having metadata and monitoring that metadata is going to be the key 
to make sure that we don't have any issues when we go to the new data. And you can see the other things, uh, the GPS and benchmarks we're working on and uh, development of our new state plane coordinate system. And with that, uh, we'll open it up, I guess, to questions for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, and thank you, Nick and Joel, for that really good information, good presentation. We do have about, uh, I guess, about 10 minutes if we have any questions. And um, of course, I will direct the questions to these three experts. <laughs> um, is, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Yes, sir. Thank you, Joe. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Hey, yes, sir. software companies like Ezra and all the other ones. So the National Geodetic Survey has been working in partnership with, with the major companies. And their, their plan is to share, once they have these trans <coughs> transformation models available, they will share them with them. So I, I expect uh, with the delay um, that once NGS flips the switch, that the vendors will have that parameters in there and it'll be, it'll be just another one that can be the transformation on the fly. Yes, sir. The, uh, we go to the international foot. They're going to drop the word international, right? They're just going to call it foot, right? Is it, isn't that what they, they're talking about? Doing? So the question is, when we go to international foot, will it just be called the foot? Um, court the register, that's currently still has the word international in there. So um, I think we'll know more uh, once probably end of this year there'll be a, probably another federal register comes out and says, here's how it's defined. Thank you, Gary. Um, anybody else? Another question. Yes, sir. I guess for one of the people in DOT, has uh, anybody considered just trying to switch the metric again to avoid confusion with survey taking international <laughs> That's I, well, yeah, let me, I, I've not heard that. I, 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 when uh, I think it was one of these guys put the slide up in 1990 metric, I remember way back, I think Debbie Barber was here and we were talking about plan sheets and switching everything from English to metric and I guess it didn't stick, but I, I, I have not heard of that. Gary, you want to add? Well, I just want to add, genetics are by legislation Everything we do is metric, but we then convert it to, to the fee for the user. So, um, but I agree. I think I have a bumper sticker off that says "Go metric." I'll like to <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, though. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else? Anybody? Any other questions? Um, 
one thing that uh, this is for Gary mainly. Uh, I think several several people in this room are non surveyors, right? So if I didn't want to explain the idea about northern east in those faults or not, is what are we talking about? Okay. So, right, so. so the question is just to kind of a brief explanation of the faults north and the faults east in our state plan coordinate system. So when the state plan coordinate system was developed, we didn't want to end up with uh, negative numbers. So we offset our central meridian by a certain amount so that anywhere in North Carolina you will have a positive coordinate system. So zero is really down somewhere I think in Alabama. So currently we have that one offset uh, of too many feet. So we're going to just change that value of the offset. But it will still allow us to have positive values. Thank you. We, we've got a time for a couple more questions. If uh, really good questions, does anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. primarily use UAS master right now this is by Trimble um, we've, used, we've used a few few others um, if you want to come talk to us at the table uh, we can tell you a little bit more I, I'm kind of you know, out of the loop on the actual processing uh, kind of the, the, the nitty-gritty is this one out with you I, I'm out of the, the nitty uh, there we go <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if that it's it up going in and out going in and out isn't it we need to stay over I don't know. Maybe that works. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, let's use this one. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, uh, UAS Master is, is what we use in photogrammetry primarily, uh, or 100%. That's by, by Trimble B Business Center. Um, so uh, we've really enjoyed that. You can really, um, you can dive really deep, and it, 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 was, it was certainly made uh, for, you know, and by photogrammetrists. Um, so you can, you have a lot of, um, a lot of control and that's what we like, especially, um, you know, if you're going to, you know, delivering some sort of pay quantity, something like an earthwork quantification that could, that could be, be, you know, go to court, you know, if that number is wrong, uh, we, we know what we did and how we did it. Um, and we could, you know, we could go talk to a judge or whatever and, and let them know exactly what we did. Um, so we, you know, we really, we really enjoyed that. We haven't really used a whole lot other stuff uh, that I can think of. Um, but come talk to, uh, is Rodney in here? There's Rod Rodney, you want to stand up for a second? <laughs> I told you I was going to do this. I probably, I'm a man to my word. Um, this, this is Rodney Huff. He, he, he oversees a lot of the processing in UAS and our squad. Um, so go find him at the table, and, and he'll be able to dive a little bit deeper than me. Um, I can just kind of just give you a high level. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Nick. I, um, we need to definitely give these guys, uh, Joe, Nick, and Gary, a round of applause for their, for all their, their presentation. Um, and I appreciate y'all being here this morning. Um, if the PDH sign up, if I understand correctly, is outside in the hallway, um, the next session will start at 9.15. Um, so we, we've got about a 15-minute break. Thank you so much. <laughs>